You know, why would the Son of God have to transfigure himself or become like light? 9,000 feet above sea level. There are two mountains that uh, claim this blessing, this event. One is Mount Tabor. The other one is Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is above Caesarea Philippi. And since Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi, and it says, after six days, Mark 9, 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Means after a week. In Caesarea Philippi, he goes to a mountain. And so the question is, why would that be done? What does it mean spiritually? Is there anything of importance? Because, you see, this passage is repeated in, 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 uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it is an important scripture. But let's read it. It says, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the inner circle, with him and led him up to a high mountain. Why not Mount Tabor? Because Mount Tabor, there was a fort on top of it in those days. So really the most, and it is the, the traditional site. But things in the scripture makes a lot of sense when you put scripture together with movement. For instance, the Via Dolorosa. It doesn't fit the scriptures. I know it looks good. It's a million dollar walk, but it doesn't fit scriptures because when you come to, to the movements of, of, the, of that situation of Via Dolorosa, uh, the death of Jesus, it, it goes from, uh, 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 it goes to the Praetorium, Betty, what is the fort? What is the name of the fort? The Praetorium to the Antonia Fortress to Caiaphas House, then to Pilate's uh, palace, and from there out of the city into the place. So there's a lot of things about the kingdom and about Jesus and about his life that doesn't fit the scriptures. And there are sites everywhere in Israel to fit the scriptures. So one of them is that they made Mount Tabor, Tabor, the mountain of transfiguration. And, and it's, it doesn't make any sense. You understand? The, and the highest mountain, 9,000 as opposed to 5,000 feet, is, is, is uh, Mount Carmel where there's snow on the top. And he's seen from a, from a difference, uh, meaning, meaning from the Lake of Galilee to, to Mount uh, Hermon, it takes, uh, takes a week to get got up there. So... High mountain means Mount Hermon, where they were all alone. And so in the scriptures, there's, a, there's a three mentions of this incident. In, and I want to explain to you what does it mean, what is, what is the main basis for that, and why you need to take that and understand that in a different way. Because when you read the scripture, if it doesn't fit the context of what it means, you get lost. It doesn't mean much to you. And it doesn't do nothing for you. The way the word does something for you is that if in it there's a revelation that explains it and you're totally convinced. Do you understand? Yes. Scripture, you can read all you want to, but if out of it you don't get something that, that, that speaks to you, that to your need, then scripture becomes history. And reading scriptures has to be God has to intervene to understand. So here's, here's a take on this. Uh, there he, there on Mount, Car on Mount Hermon, he was transfigured before them. Peter, James, and John. So we need to know what transfigured means. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking to Jesus. Now that's just a little... That's a lot there. And Elijah and Moses showed up out of nowhere and began talking to Jesus. Now, I mean, that simply just opens up all kinds of questions is how can they come out of somewhere and show up this way? Okay. And then it says this. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. 
Let us put three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not uh, know what to say, and they, they were so frightened, so scared. And of course, you know, boots, the, uh, the, the, the Feast of the Tabernacles, there are little places you can go in that are built, and, and they wanted a place of, uh, of being together, camping, so to speak. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. That is also scripturally and repeated several times. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw, no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And so everything disappears. As Jesus was coming down the mountain, coming down, meaning they had to get up the mountain, and Mount Tabor today is 9,000 feet. The time of Jesus could have been 12,000 feet. Erosion, time, and all of that. So as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Meaning, let's not do anything about this until there is something called what? The resurrection. Raises all kinds of questions. And it says, they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. That's another big, what do you mean? Okay. Why wouldn't the disciples know that there would be Christ right, being risen from the dead? And, and what, what, shouldn't they by now have some idea? Another question. And they asked him, why do you teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? He called, they called Jesus teachers of the law. Why do the teachers of the law, I mean, not Jesus, uh, say that Elijah must come first? And they did. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does not come first. Uh, Elijah does come first and restore, restore all things. Why then it is written that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? But I'll tell you, he answered his own question. Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. And that is easy to explain. Let's have a prayer. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you bless us this evening. We all understand this in the context of our need. Just to know history and to be enlightened by some type of knowledge that is no good for us to apply uh, we don't need it. We want you to help us because this scripture needs to talk to us and to our needs while we are, are struggling. Things we have to do from the government all the way to social security, all the way to employment, all the way to marriage, all the way to difficulties, all the way to, 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 to pressure in, in doing things for you and, and keeping the kingdom up and, and, and paying bills and, and, and taxes. We just ask you, Lord to help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. i never seen any scripture that when you get it and chew on it, doesn't apply to your need. As a matter of fact, I had a lot of problems with teaching or preaching that just sound good. And I rebelled. And of course, I didn't understand that rebelling over the status quo would cause so much commotion. And for me, it caused a lot of commotion, <laughs> meaning I became crazy, Wacky, out of order, weird, and uh, I've been called all kinds of names, mainly because I'm more, I'm a ordained pastor for 38 years from a denomination, and, and the denomination has a ways of thinking, and, uh, and so I broke the mold and began doing. I don't believe that preaching makes, uh, uh, supposed to you like what I said. It doesn't make any sense you liking or not. You need to be fed. You've got to have something to chew on it. Or you try to fall in love with a preacher. That's a bunch of nonsense. You understand? Liking a preacher is really not necessary. <laughs> Bring food, though. <laughs> and so I got this idea in my mind. And so this is the way uh, after six days, Duke took Jesus Peter, J J Peter, James, and John with him and led them to a high mountain where they're all alone. Now, in the context of the big picture, we're talking about two and a half years in the Galilee. These guys were hard-headed people. They were not 
able to understand all of this. You're talking about, you're talking about a, a brain scientist, a surgeon, coming to you and saying, let's go to the hospital. He opens the brain and gives you two scalps and says, fix it. And you're saying, where, how? What do I do? Do I click here? You click here, the hand move, okay? You click, the leg move, then what? <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. And so these disciples were given all kinds of things to understand and to know. And they were not really a happy camper. They were confused, afraid. They were in the, they were in the boat and Jesus begins to walk on the water after nine hours of prayer and calms the sea. That would scare you to no end. And so, and so this event completes two and a half years in Galilee after the miracles that occurred in a, in a three and a half mile by, by, by two miles from Bethesda to Capernaum to Chorazin, and that completed the ministry of Jesus as it is for three for two and a half years. And so now we're coming to the, to the Mount of Transfiguration. We're coming to what's really happening uh, to those disciples because he had to break through them. So he took Peter, James, and John. Now, what can I make? I'm explaining this. You went out and rent an apartment, Sandy, before you got a job. Does that make sense? Am I making sense? Really, really, really. You first get a job and then you get the apartment, right? Well, she moved in faith. I never seen in the kingdom anything done. Uh, you know, Jessica moved to Athens and quit her job before she had any money. Y'all know that? Where is Jessica? Yes, she's right there. Well, sorry, Jessica. I was looking for you here. Jessica uh, quit her job and came to Athens uh, without having any money. And the Lord provided the money after she made a decision. Meaning that in the kingdom, you must move in faith first before you, uh, you expect God to move. It's just a standard. You move always in faith. And everything that you do, you put faith first and stop bothering God saying it's not going to work. If you put faith first, God moves. And so he takes Peter, James, and John. Why Peter, James, and John? Why not all the 12? You don't need it. Say this, with God, little means more. And so he takes Peter, James, and John. Now, why did Peter, James, and John went? Because he, I really believe that Jesus loved those three, but he want, a three is enough than nine. It, it creates more confusion. The kingdom grows out of nothing. Let me tell you the biggest surprise I had on this trip to Israel. I went into a place called the Pool of Bethesda, and they were praying uh, for people there. And a, and a lady came to me from the Philistine and a crowd formed because we were praying for about 18 people before too long. We had 50, 60, 100 and we prayed for a couple hours for everybody that came in. Into the, I mean, it became a, a meeting. <laughs> and one lady said, I know, I know Rick Bonfim for internet. Internet. Rick Bonfim? Oh, I know. I download material. Well, you, I like your minute. You understand? And I thought to myself, you see, you see, why would a website make any sense? You see, you know, God can use anything you do. He don't have to sort of uh, uh, make sure that you do it. You just do it by faith and God provides the increase. And, and all these this, this girls, Jessica and Allison and, and Rachel, they're working on a new website. I mean, they're working hard every day of the week. Rachel just comes out of like this, you know. On the, she's on the computer all day, and, uh, and uh, she, uh, uh, and we just, it's a, it's a big old, big old site full of teachings and videos and, 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 and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I don't know what that would do, but we put, put it out there in 50 languages, and the Lord used it for His glory. I don't know. I, 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 all I know is that you just do the work and let the Lord use it, okay? 
So he took Peter, James, and John with him because up to now, they could not understand even the multiplication miracles. Their hearts were hardened. What it simply means is that the more you see of God in his glory, the harder you become inside. Very difficult. Why would that be the case? Why not just make sure that you all fall in love with Jesus and grow and get everything? It's because many are going to be called, but few elected. The kingdom is not Walmart approach. You're going to have to work for this. You're going to have to have faith on this. You're going to have to struggle with this. You're going to have to understand, you know, uh, I've been talking to Blake and Blake's been talking to me in, in a high level now, you know, a uh, uh, high, deep level. I mean, I, I, I like to be on a, on a date with both of you and see, and see what he talks about. Because he must talk about all kinds of things that have nothing uh, uh, that she's not interested in. Listen, can you shut up about God and, and give me a kiss or something? You know. <laughs> the reason why is because as, as you struggle, as you, as you struggle, as you begin to wanting to grow, the Holy Spirit begins to take hold of your life, doing for you what needs to be done in the purpose of God, in the kingdom of God, and you become engaged in the will of God, and life begins developing. I remember I played guitar for at least uh, 10 years before I understood what the music meant. And I had a bunch of recordings, and I didn't know what it meant, but I know now what it meant. You understand? And so he took a Peter, Peter, James, and John, and they were all alone on this 9,000 feet mountain. There was, in the presence of them, Jesus was transfigured. Here's the other problem. Jesus was the Son of God embodied into human form. Agreed? He is just like you and I. Meaning that communion with God can make you transfigured. You can turn into something else. In other words, you don't have to press a button. As you walk with Jesus, as you live with Jesus Christ, as you get to know him, you're going to have experiences that are out of this world. Let's talk about one of them. It happened at the Pool of Bethesda. Well, there was about 18 people before too long. It was a large crowd. We're praying for everybody. Wasn't it? That was, oh, that was like out of the movies, wasn't it? People coming for prayer, and before too long, the, our team is praying for everybody. <laughs> That's just not, not, not normal. So what do you mean transfigured? It means that the power of the Holy Spirit can overshadow you, and the glory of God can come over you. That's what it means. Yes. Now, that's not really something for First Methodist, First Baptist member. You know, to do that in the 11 o'clock service. That can really disrupt the peace. But it happens to fulfill a purpose. Sometimes in your life, you're going to experience something out of body, experience supernatural experience. You know, we prayed for five hours in Brazil for a church. Five hours. When we left there, we were happier than before, not tired, and we were just happy, rejoicing. That was an out-of-body experience. It was a, a glorified experience. It simply means that as you're having low points in your life where you're struggling, having problems, difficulties, there is some high points. You can. You can. You can experience. You can experience. So, so why come to a Bible study? So you can hear this so you know that there is a way you can, you can get out of this life for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Mary Lucy turns the music on down there at the house, and she goes on praising and singing and rejoicing. Before too long, she's singing high. Woo Amen? Amen. And, 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 and I, I don't interrupt. I just leave because I know she's not there. Okay. <laughs> His clothes became dazzling white than anyone, anyone could bleach it, and the one in the world could bleach. It means in the time of Jesus, they knew how to bleach. Yes, they did. In the time of Paul, they bleached clothing in different colors. Meaning that they knew true white and true 
yellow and true green. They knew color. And what Jesus became was light, supernatural light. Now, when the glory of God comes in, something happens. In this case, it brought people back from the dead. Elijah died and Moses was taken away. Because you see eternity as something that has no light in it. When I'm dead, I'm dead. It's all gone. You know, you can't take it with you. Hear that? You know, done. And what this simply says to you is that there is eternal life. If Moses <laughs> and Elijah came to talk with Peter, James, and John, there is eternity. And people in eternity are alive. Aren't you so happy? So when your grandparents died, you're gonna, they're, not, they're not somewhere in a stinky hole six feet. My mother is in heaven dancing and singing and talking and rejoicing. And Mary Lucy's grandmother, 98, what's her name? Huh? Nistora, 98 years old. Mary Lucy's mom all lived to 98, 97. Imagine they're all life. Now, this is very good. I, I like this. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, B. Why did he say Rabbi? It's because yet he could not understand that he's in the presence of the Almighty God in the Son of the living God. So, you see, his mind is locked. What does he mean? It means that if you know about Jesus, one thing, but if you have him in your heart, that's another. How do you know him? We don't know all of him. But if you know that he's the son of God, when you mention Jesus and you sing these songs, it warms you up. It turns you, a, there's a button and you begin to grow. Amen? Amen. And then it says this, which is very, very interesting. It says, uh, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and for Elijah. He did, he did not know how to say because they were so frightened. Meaning, can we have more of this feeling? Can we get some of this juice? It, it, what is this juice? The presence of God. Yes. You can have great worship. You can have a band with 15,000 people singing and no presence. But the presence of God warms you up. So how do you know where to go, what to do? You get the presence. Okay? You need the presence. What does the presence do? It heals you. You know how hard it is when you have a problem that is facing you, big time problem. You don't know how to solve what's going to happen. And you go to bed nervous. You can't sleep at night. Anybody have that? You turn in bed saying, oh, my goodness gracious, what's going to happen? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, how can I do this? How can I be? Okay. And then the presence of God comes over you and overshadows you. And you begin sensing the presence of God. And what happens? You don't, you don't worry about it anymore. Don't you want that? You need that. And so they wanted that. They, they felt something. You know, for Peter to say, let's stick around. How can you stick around with somebody who turns white as light in Elijah? Elijah especially. You know, that prophet killed 450 people in Mount Carmel and cut their necks. If I see Elijah, I'm running. And here, the angel, and Moses, do you know Moses? The man who, who, what is Moses, the, the most, the, high, the best servant God has ever had? The one who was in the presence of God at Mount Sinai? You know, Moses. It's like you're sitting here, and that comes Ronald Reagan in the room. You know, Martin Luther King walks in. Oh, <laughs> I know you're dead. I've seen your funeral. <laughs> I'm bleeding. <laughs> I am, I'm going to stay. <laughs> Woo! I'll be out of the door. Why did they stay? It's because those two people in Jesus began the glory of God overshadow. So what I'm saying to you is that there's no way you can live in the world and not take the glory of God with you to help you overcome these things. The glory of God overcomes it. The presence of God overcomes it. The reason why they didn't run like we would run, I don't think. Do you know? What would you do if Ronald Reagan walks through that door? 
and say, fellow Americans, how do you, what do you do? Tell me. Tell me if Martin Luther, I have a dream. Imagine, excuse me. Uh, you have, <laughs> you're, <laughs> you understand? They were special figures. They were powerful people. But the presence of God made them ask, why don't we stay some more? I like, this feels good. This is really good. Oh, man, give me some more of this. Please, I want to stay here, okay? And then uh, uh, the cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. Say with me, every time there's a cloud, God's going to say something. Now, what is a cloud means here? Is that the presence, the presence of God is one thing, the, the, the voice of God is another. Where did the cloud appear before? Anybody remember? It appeared, huh? Through the desert. And then on the baptism of, uh, 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 on the baptism of, of, of Paul, the light came in and the glory of God came in. So a cloud, where did God say the same thing in a different context? He said it at the baptism of John the Baptist. Remember? This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. One more time, Jesus says, what is God doing here? God is saying to them, listen, you guys, you fishermen, listen to me. This Man close to you is my son whom we all please. And, and here's the words that uh, came from heaven. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Yeah. Now I tell you, this must have felt good for Jesus. Thank you, Dad. I've been trying desperately. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You see? Now, don't you feel kind of interesting that, the, that God came in at the moment of this, to say to the man, this is my son. Why would God do this? It's because they didn't know he was. They called him what? Ra? Rabbi. So God says, this is my son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anything, uh, anyone except, uh, with them except Jesus. Say a little bit of God fixes the whole. Completely. So I want you tonight to, to, to let the problems that you have in your mind to quiet down. See, you, 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 you're losing your peace. You, you're losing your direction. You want answers now in the way. See, some of you have a plan, and that's your problem. <laughs> because you have been planned up. This is what I want. In other words, say, say with you, God is not going to bless me. If my plan is already decided. If you want God to lead you, you can't say to him, Lord, lead me. But I, in a minute, I have a plan. Would you agree? Would you agree? And so, and so the Lord simply uh, just came out, disappeared. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Why? Why would the resurrection be a way for them to tell? What do you think? Why would Jesus tell them to shut up about this? Any ideas? That's the answer. You see, the glory of God was so overwhelming that would simply protect him from what he needed to do in order to die for our sins. Be the sacrifice unto God that removed the sins of the whole world. He had to die. It was the scriptures. It was the plan and God's plan. He had to walk in God's plan. And so don't tell nothing about me and about seeing Elijah and Moses. Imagine if you came to Jerusalem and said, Fellows, I was at Mount Hermon and, and I saw Moses and Elijah talking to this man. That creates a major problem. Amen? Jesus never spoke about himself or elevated himself to any size. Answer no accusation and die as a lamb. 
to slaughter. And so gently, quietly, tell me this. Say, 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 if you have a plan in you for your life, do you follow the will of God so gently? Or you create more plans and more activity? You just wait on the Lord, don't you? Just wait on the Lord for him to move. In other words, get the apartment and the job will come. Okay. And so, and so not telling it was good. Uh, they kept the matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. You know, there are a lot of things in the scriptures where we don't understand. You don't have the full knowledge of what it means. But the thing to do is to keep on chewing on them and allow God to reveal to you when the time comes. Say this, God will not allow to you information that is not applicable. Why would God give you a bunch of stuff to you that can be used? And the disciples knew that there would be something happening to Jesus. He warned them and told them, not, but they couldn't understand what it meant yet. It wasn't clear in their minds. We can't believe you're going to die. I, 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 you're going to be crucified. Now let's take a look at the last of it. And they asked him, why do you teach of the law say that it must come first? Why did the teacher of the law reply, to be sure Elijah does come first and restore all things? Why did it written that the Son of Man must suffer uh, and, uh, and be rejected? He answers, I'll tell you, Elijah has come. Elijah here is who? John, John the Baptist. Why John the Baptist? Because Elijah represents a form of service and power and goodness and strength at the feet of God. Anyone who serves the Lord continuously, it's called Elijah. Elijah is the type of servant who all he does, all she does, is to serve God 24-7 continuously. Okay? Because the power of God rests, rests upon you. And so, and so the idea here is that Elijah uh, is John the Baptist, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written. So let's take a look. Tell me, what does this scripture say to you? What did you understand out of this? Why the transfiguration? Anybody? Why the transfiguration? Why the transfiguration occurred? Can you give me an answer? As a, as a sign? As a sign for them to believe. So it gave very strong testimony in the hearts of the disciples. And I, I think he took at least three because if you tell, if one or two people tell you something, maybe you don't believe it. Like you start telling yes. yourself, you're going to believe. Uh -huh. They can't all make it up together. Yes, yes. The power of testimony. When I witnessed three of us, the power of testimony. You know, you know, you know after this event in the Bible, the disciples changed their hearts completely. The other nine lined up, and they became disciples. God, God builds you up and teach you and disciple you and minister to you and care for you and, and let you experience problems and difficulties and all kinds of things. And he continues to teach you because he has a plan. If you really love God, you have to go through this period of suffering and struggling and putting things together and understanding. It's not going to be uh, 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 tulips and roses all the time. It's difficult. I tell you, in a period of 40 years of ministry, 45, maybe close to 50, I have gone to horrible pain in many areas. We have struggled years we don't know what to do. Okay, 20 years, I think, Mary Lucy and I uh, uh, dressed from the thrifty store at Columbia Theological Seminary. We, didn't, we never had any clothing. We lived in literal poverty for 20 years. 
God provide all the food and the shelter. But we didn't have an extra pair of pants, not an extra pair of shoes, a lot of duct tape. And he said, Rick, why did God keep you that way? So when he began to bless me, I knew it was from him and not from me. Now, did I have to go through this? Yes, I did. Because I could have been bought by all kinds of, I mean, I had some big offers and I didn't take any of them because I loved what God did instead of what other people would do. You see, like Christian life has experiences. If you're struggling right now, is a sign that something's happening with you and God is dealing with you. Oh, we got a problem. Something bad is happening. Well, that might be something that God allowed it to happen so you can understand his hand because you don't understand when God moves. The only way sometimes you understand when God moves is when you're down and out and he comes to pull you up. So, so bad is not always bad. Difficulties are not always bad. This scripture is to convince the disciples that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is going to come and rescue if you are faithful, obedient to Him. You understand? It's not going to be easy. He didn't say it was easy. Two and a half years to convince 12 men. Gosh, it took a long time. My goodness. It wasn't Peter, as Sister Philippi says, you are the Son of God. And, Peter, and Jesus said, uh, Peter, son, um, this is not revealed to you by men, but my Father who is in heaven. And whatever you touch on earth will be touched in heaven. What is you lose on earth is lost in heaven. And, and, uh, and, and, and the gates of hell is not prevailed against my church. And, and Peter heard for the first time that in front of him is the Son of God. So it takes a while. I know somebody who has struggled 20 years, 30 years with pain and agony and bad news. And they came to Christ now. And in, in, a, in six months, they want everything clean. It's, it's not, it's not going to happen. It'll take a little time. If you are listening to me and you come to Christ in the last year or so or something happened, give God a little time to deal with the situation. Don't give up on it. Okay, don't, and if, if, if the path goes down and dips a little bit and goes up, don't doubt the Lord. Don't, in other words, some of us, unless he's 100% tops and we are really having a, God has left, God will take you through the valley. Oh, Rick, I, I want to get married. I, 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 I believe I'm going to be single and become a librarian. And if I don't get married, I, okay. And you might be marrying to five divorces because you're out of the plan of God. You understand? You can't, you can't plan your life the way you see it. You cannot make choices that are not yours. You can't. Become the player and the referee at the same time. Oh, but unless mm, this is what I, I feel. It. If you feel it, you're in really bad shape. Oh, Rick, I have this feeling, okay? The feeling in my heart. Okay, okay, you're in trouble. It's not by feeling, it's by faith. It's very difficult to stop feeling, you know that? Very difficult to stop feeling because all of us want to take hold of what we want. This is what I want. This is what I want. <laughs> There's a young man that uh, been in trouble most of his life. Most of his life. And went to jail 45 days. I went to court with him. And, uh, and walk with him. Uh, you know, his hands are in the jail right there in front of me. And I approached the young man. The police came. Stop! I need to talk to him. I'm a his preacher. Come on, come on, come on! Give me a break. Talk to the preacher. So I prayed with him, and he went to jail. And about a week passed. I went to the to the to the uh, sheriff. I said, Sheriff, you guys got a young man here, and uh, and I can help him. I don't think you can, but I can help him. What do you mean? Well, I can take him to Brazil for 30 days if you let him go. Why, why 45 days? Let me have him for 30 days and I'll do some. And for 30 days, he, he, he said, okay, you take him. And so a 45-day thing turned into a week. And I took him to Brazil. And who was there? Who, who was there on this trip? Yeah, what's his name? Josh. Joshua what? Wingate. Wingate. 
had a meeting with the Lord Jesus. Do you know Josh comes every month to give me money, $30? A kid like that working so hard, giving $30, that's a lot of money. It's not the $30. It's that he, he had an experience with Christ that changed his life. You know now, was J.O. bad? No. It was very good. Some children need to see a judge before they change their minds. Some children need to be squeezed <laughs> to get understanding that life's not that simple. You understand? Say, say, Heavenly Father, I want to put my faith on you, my trust in you, and I want to stop managing my personal life. Lord, I, I need to let you take care of me. But I also want to tell you, I don't want to whine as we go. I don't want to have a big lip as we go. And keep on saying, <laughs> if it's not my way, I'm not happy. I want to be happy in all circumstances, be good or bad. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to remove my heart out of this feeling thing. Because the more I feel it, the more in trouble I am. I want to know in my heart that you know me, that you care for me, that my future's in your hands, that I'm covered by your blood, covered by your mercy, covered by your spirit, and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. But if I have to have hell, bring it on in the name of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to bless my life in the way you want to bless me. But I want to be glorified. I want to be transformed into another person. I want to have the experiences that will translate into me the glory of God beyond my understanding, beyond my reason, beyond my know-how, beyond my comprehension. I'm in this for eternity, not just to pay taxes. In Jesus' name, say in the name of Jesus. Would you stand now and as we sing, I want you to pray it loud a couple of couples. Say loud. You need, to, you need to verbalize your faith. I tell you, the reason why we don't do it is because we're embarrassed, okay? I pray all the way down here. Say, Lord, I need a word. And you know that I'm really, I want to call, you teach. I can't do it. No, I have to do this. I took a nap on the car. You know, I had 13 hours flying, flying to Israel, coming back. Was well, actually 70 hours, and then seven hours of jet lag. And I told Mary Lucy, I need to do this, and I feel better now than I felt when I came. You understand? And tomorrow morning, I'll be at a conference call with somebody in the ministry at 5 30 in the morning to about 6 30, one hour. How do I do this? How am I going to do this? I, I don't do it. The Lord does it. See, see, I, he, I need him this way. I, I'm, I'm trusting him.